Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Exponential Finance Podcast. Today, we're excited to welcome Henry Chong, who's the CEO of Fuzon, a digital asset exchange. Hi, yes, Henry. hello. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. It's, uh, we're, we're all in Zoom heaven these days. So yes. One after the other. It's quite fun. Yes, um, absolutely. I saw you a few weeks back with our good friends, Merco Science. You were on a panel yes. there. And it, it struck me for two reasons. One is, um, I think your explanations and, and point of views were super crisp and super clearly uh, expressed, uh, stuck out from all the other panelists. And uh, secondly, you have a very interesting mm -hmm. background and I smell a bit of a um, transformation journey in that as well. <laughs> yes. uh, Given that Fusan uh, has a certain origin story yes. coming out of the, the family office uh, yes. services space. So maybe to start things off, start at the beginning and uh, how, mm. how you got here ultimately. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, I guess the story is a little unique in the sense that uh, you mentioned transformation. Um, you know, Fusan as a company was originally founded in 2014. Uh, actually uh, to do fund management for both family offices and institutions. Uh, so we set up and managed um, licensed entities in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. Uh, but even before that, um, my family founded and continues to operate uh, a group called the Portcullis Group that for the last uh, 37 years now has helped, uh, again, both families and institutions operate what I broadly think of as financial infrastructure. Uh, the plumbing, the boring stuff that no one ever likes to look at, but that keeps everything ticking over. Uh, and, and we would provide services uh, such as acting as company secretary, um, acting as trustees, as fund administrators, custodians, uh, the real base level uh, guts uh, that, that a lot of the capital markets is based on. So to give you an example, uh, if you set up a, a BVI company, um, which is used obviously in a plethora of capital markets transactions. Uh, someone somewhere needs to actually go to the registrar, incorporate the company, and then manage that, that, that company entity. Um, and I think a lot of people in today's world, given how digital everything is, don't understand how paper-based a lot of those processes are. Right? You assume that, oh, this is high finance and millions and millions of dollars of transactions, and surely there's some magical process failing to realize that actually in many cases there are you know humans hitting print on printers to print out share certificates um, and really that that that's what set fusang on this whole journey where about three and a half years ago we were looking to buy ethereum out of one of our regulated funds and we decided that we couldn't not because of the asset but because we couldn't find any service providers we couldn't find brokers or fund administrators or custodians uh, that, that, that's changed a little bit over the last few years, but, but not that much. You know, a lot of people are very focused on pure uh, crypto assets, things like Bitcoin. How do I trade it? How do I hold it? Um, and thinking a little less about what happens if I'm looking at a blockchain-based security. What if these are company shares? What does that mean, really? Uh, what does it mean both to the investor and also to the company who's looking to issue these shares? And more specifically, can someone actually help me solve all of my problems, not just regulatory and et cetera, but operationally, like who is literally helping me do each step of the process. And for traditional assets, that infrastructure exists. It is clunky. It requires a huge number of firms to do, but it exists. And it exists in such a way that people don't need to really think about it. Right. I want to IPO a company in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. I set up a Cayman company. I don't really know what, how that works, but all I know is I go talk to a company secretary and they handle it for me. Right. There are a whole industry of lawyers and et cetera to do these jobs. Uh, and so for better or for worse, it works. Right. But it works when you look one layer down. It works because there's a lot of paper and a lot of people involved. And that really is what got us thinking, where we said anything based on people and based on paper cannot survive in 2020. Certainly not in today's world where, I mean, even us, right, we're talking on Zoom. How can it be that where everything else is digitized, somehow the base level of financial markets, these millions and millions of dollars escapes digitization? And like I said, I, I think it's, it's partly the case because people just don't realize 
uh, including people in the finance industry. You know, I have a lot of friends who used to work at giant hedge funds and then spun out to start their own hedge fund. And they'd say things like, oh, I, I never realized the actual operational mess that goes into just buying a share, right? I used to call my prime broker Goldman Sachs and then some magic happens and I don't even know where it is, but I trust that I own the share somewhere. And once you actually have to do it yourself and start thinking about these operational processes, that's when you realize just how messy it is. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, sit, I'm sitting here in Hong Kong now. I talk to a lot of people about the fact that Hong Kong private companies still require physical paper shares. And no one believes me. They say, it can't be true. And I'm like, yeah, right? Hong Kong companies must have physical paper shares. And every time you transfer them, you must pay stamp duty. And in Hong Kong, stamp duty must be stamped. I mean, it's a chop. You go to the stamp duty office, they go, chook, and then the share transfers. And I think a lot of people, when I say that, it just blows their mind. Right? That, that in 2020, when so many things are being digitized, that that is still the case. And that's really what Fusang is trying to solve for. And we say, look, a lot of other people are going to touch on different areas of financial infrastructure. Um, our, what, what we want to squarely focus on is that base level of how exactly do we take these paper shares? And when I say paper shares, so Hong Kong has physical paper shares, but even um, you know, different countries, to me, it's still paper as a technologist, right? You might have a PDF, but you know, it's, it's a picture file. It's not machine intelligible. And, and I said to an engineer, that's paper <laughs> effectively. And our question has always been, how do we take these paper shares, assets, bonds, funds, the whole world of traditional assets out there and just represent them in digital format? And that's it. We're not really looking to reinvent the wheel or magic up new kinds of assets. We're just looking at how can we bring digitization to finance to these assets in the same way as I think digitization will touch everything else in the world. And starting to think about this in 2015, you mm -hmm. were clearly very early and also service providers in mm -hmm. this field didn't exist. And yes. of course, everybody knows the history. We have the ICO wave, we have the yes. IEO wave, and now we clearly have the security token mm -hmm. wave. So, um, everybody has caught up with you in a way. Yes. How has the thinking around how you're going to build this business changed mm -hmm. then over the four mm -hmm. years? Possibly. Yeah. So I, I actually don't think we've had the security token wave yet. I think that there is the most colossal hype execution mismatch I've ever seen in security tokens in that everybody talks about them and most people will say, sure, they're the future, right? Okay, we had ICOs. It was fun. It was an interesting proof of concept, but at some point we really need to move towards what does this really represent? What exactly am I buying? So I think everyone buys into the concept, but I always say, where are they exactly? Right. And, and, and even though a lot of companies have started to issue security tokens in different formats, um, the number of security tokens that are listed and traded that are accessible are very few. You know, um, if you went to go ask man on the street in Hong Kong or Japan, and you said, uh, uh, name me one STO and where would you go to buy it? Uh, the answer is don't know. Even for people like myself in this industry, it's not entirely obvious where I would go right now to, to actually execute on these things. Um, and so to your question, uh, that, that's really what we've squarely been focused on these last few years. How do we build the platforms that will allow end investors to ac access these things? so that we can answer that question of how exactly do I go buy one of these things, but also on the issuer side, the company side who's creating these securities, how do we help them take care of all the operational headaches? Just like right now, if you want to issue paper shares, there are people to help you do it so that they don't have to worry too much about the underlying technology layer. And, you know, I, I, I just, I see a lot of our, of the, the, the security side of the digital asset industry still stuck in that mode of, I'm building the latest, greatest uh, technology issuance platform and it's going to be magic. Um, and I'm like, look, that's all great. But as it is, what we have today with paper shares is so archaic, anything is an improvement. And so to me, the, the question is more, can you execute on something end to end? More so than do you have the perfect, perfect platform? Um, not least of which is because like it or not, regulators will always try and fit new things into existing boxes. That's just the way it is, right? They see something, they say, where does this go exactly? And so our belief has been that, like it or not, the financial industry will continue to need all of the roles that you see today. Brokers, custodians, fund administrators, underwriters, listings, everything. 
uh, who plays those roles, I think can and will change a lot because of technology, but you'll still need someone to wear that hat. And like it or not, regulators will still treat you you know, the same as any other firm. And, and that's, that, that, that's the strategy, I guess, that we've adopted in, in all of these years to say, okay, whenever we go see a regulator, we tell them, uh, I'm creating digital shares. We think that we can comply with all of your usual rules around securities. And that's it. And they go, hmm, okay, fine, <laughs> right? As long as you tell me it's a share and, and you can meet my rules, go do whatever you want. I don't really care about the technology layer. Uh, and so to me, again, that, that's always the question. Can we make it fit into existing regulation? Can we actually help issuers through that operational process end to end? And perhaps most importantly, for end investors, is it convenient for them to actually go and buy these things, you know, in, in a way that they don't need to care about what the underlying asset is? No different than when I go buy Apple shares, let's face it, the vast majority of people have no clue where those shares are for that matter, right? You buy the share and then what, where is it? You know, what are you buying exactly? Where is Apple even incorporated? I mean, in terms of, you know, like most people, I guarantee you have no idea. They've never seen a, an actual Apple share certificate. They just say, well, you know what? I have a, I have trust, right? People buy it all the time, so it must be fine. I call my broker on the phone and I say, buy me an Apple share. And he says, done. And I trust that it's done. And I feel like that's where the security token industry needs to get to. Where people say, you know, I log into platforms like the Fusang Exchange, I click to buy and I have trust that the magic has happened and I now get to own a security token. And the question is, can we offer a unique experience to investors? Like, can we give them access that is better, cheaper, faster than traditional assets? And most importantly, are there interesting and unique assets for them to buy that they cannot access right now? Okay, let's accept that there are archaic processes and they can be more efficient, but picking up on your end user yes. point, right? I mean, uh, especially in the US or even in Hong Kong with eight mm -hmm. securities, mm -hmm. you can trade accurately mm -hmm. for free. Yes. Yes. And uh, so from an end user experience perspective, whatever mm -hmm. they do with the order flow and selling it to hedge funds mm -hmm. or bank, yes. that's a different yes. story, but maybe that con doesn't concern me then either. Um, it is a pretty mm -hmm. simple and in the case of a Robin Hood, also mm -hmm. very gaming yes. experience. Yes. So there's hardly anything you can improve mm -hmm. on that for me necessarily, mm -hmm. but the unique asset side, yes. It could be an interesting one. Absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, at least with the way Fuxang is architected, we view blockchain technology as making our lives easier, right? Our end customers have no direct contact with the blockchain. No different than when you click to buy a share on Robin Hood, you don't really under see the, the backend stuff. You just say, I want to deal with a user interface. Um, and we've built our user interface in such a way that both retail investors can just log in and execute trades. But also if you're a hedge fund, right? We've always thought that you will want to be able to route trades to us like you route trades to any traditional exchange. And I think the issue right now is a lot of uh, venues go to these funds and say, hey, um, if you sign up for a MetaMask wallet and you see, you know, here's how the blockchain works and this is how you can make a trade and they say, ah, I'm not interested, right? They just say, I have a brokerage system. If I can plug my existing brokerage system into your exchange, yeah, sure, no, well, I'll, I'll make trades. If you tell me I need to replicate a whole stack of infrastructure to make a few trades, I'm not interested. Imagine if you were a traditional stock exchange and you went to a fund and you said, hey, to trade with my stock exchange, you must rebuild everything. People would say, ah, there are plenty of other stocks in the world to trade. So in terms of the investor side, I completely agree, right? It has to be a very thin and a very transparent layer to the user where they don't really need to care. And it's just about, okay, access is easy enough number one, and then number two, the question is, what am I buying? And I think that's also a big problem in the security token industry right now, where uh, people buy assets or pitched assets purely on the basis that they are a digital asset. Uh, and to be fair, that's kind of how the crypto and ICO world has worked so far. People buy things just because it's digital, right? Without really looking at the underlying, but I don't think that's the way it can or should work. Right? And certainly once you get to real world company shares, people are going to say, wait a minute, uh, what's the company, right? Show me its info, show me its financials. What really am I buying? And, and to your point, that's where we think this is most exciting security tokens, where 
I'll give you a very concrete example. So Fusang ourselves, we have digitized 100% of our shares. Um, these are not P uh, 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 digital tokens that map to a paper share somewhere else, because to me, you're just doubling the work. These really are the digital share certificate. Um, and we've received specific approval to keep a purely blockchain-based register of members. But again, those are benefits to us, the company, because what it allows us to do is, number one, we can start to run a far more scaled cap table than we ever could before. Uh, so already today, you, know, you can go to Etherscan and type in Fusang and you'll see that, it, you, know, you can see our real-time register of members and you can see that we've got over 400 shareholders already. And that is something that we would never be willing to do as a company if we had paper shares, right? We said, I want a few big investors and I just deal with them. Um, but because it's digital to us, it makes no difference really how many shareholders we have, how big a shareholder they are. Again, we can maintain all of that in real time. And uh, again, even though we are not yet listed and, and we're not traded on our own exchange, um, we have already allowed those shares to be freely transferable. So anybody, you, for example, could go to our website, uh, sign up for an account, go through our online KYC process, send me your wallet address, and I can just send you 10 shares because I know that the, the registered members will auto update. So number one is it allows us to run a much more scaled cap table where we can take a lot more investors, but because we can take more and smaller investors, we can start to rethink the entire fundraising process. Uh, so Fusang right now is going through a pre-IPO round and, the, and, and a large reason why we're doing that is we wanted to be able to demonstrate that, hey, we ourselves will be the test case for our own technology. And even though this is technically a private placement, meaning only to accredited investors, um, we don't see any reason why that couldn't potentially be thousands of accredited investors investing for as little as, I don't know, let's say a thousand US dollars. Again, right now, Private placement means talk to a few institutional investors or family and friends for relatively big sums of money. And then one day you go public and that means lots and lots of retail investors, small tickets. I think that's a false dichotomy, right? That, that's purely down to operational restrictions right now. But once everything is digitized, like for our own shares, we can say, look, go to our website, right? You can view our offering documents. You can go through a purely online KYC process. You can send us money and we can send you back digital shares all without us having to meet face to face, which obviously, especially in a COVID world is particularly useful. And that one thing alone, right? Just that one ability to rethink how you play shares, I think is a much bigger deal than people realize. You know, I think a lot of people are caught up trying to do stuff that's kind of up here and very interesting and sexy without first worrying about the basics. But I think those basics are interesting enough because you know, to me, the ability to digitize what it means in terms of a company doing fundraising, in terms of who can be your shareholder, it's, it's very similar to the shift from traditional, you know, offline commerce to e-commerce. You know, e-commerce wasn't just mail order catalogs online. It, it, you know, it really redefines that uh, relationship between, you know, the, the buyer and, and the seller in that uh, it, it disintermediated that process. Right? I now can set up a company and sell globally on Amazon direct to my consumer, where before I would have had to go to the Lane Crawfords of the world and beg them to put my product on their shelves in the front. Right? The intermediaries used to have all the power, the distribution networks, and now it's flipped so that the companies and the brands have the power because they can go direct to consumer. The same thing has happened for social media. Right? It wasn't just, oh, it's online communication it reshapes that relationship. So before the distribution channels, the magazines had all the control. You had to go run an ad in these distribution channels. Now I can go direct and talk directly to my consumer. So you can sell direct to consumer, you can communicate direct to consumer, but even if you're a very digital company who does everything digitally today, if you wanna raise money, you talk to a bank or you talk to a venture capital fund or you talk to some family friends. Right? And, and to me, the, the exciting thing about digital assets is we can take that same fundraising process and digitize it in the same way we have for how we sell goods and how we communicate to our customers. Agreed. Um, there was quite a bit in there I want to come back to also in terms yes. of the, the identity. But I wanted to understand first a bit your structure. So what I've seen is you are registered in Labuan. 
It's like the offshore yes. Malaysian financial center. Yes. And you have a custodian license in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. Yes. Now you're yes. in Hong Kong, but so are you operating the exchange in Hong Kong as well? No, so our the, the stock exchange license sits in Labuan, which is, as you said, our jurisdiction of Malaysia. Um, we situated uh, our custodian platform in Hong Kong because we, we hold all of those assets on trust for clients and, and how we do that is a whole nother discussion. Um, but in terms of the actual vehicle, so Fusang's own parent company, like I said, we have that, that's situated in Labuan and we've digitized those shares. Uh, and part of the reason why we picked Labuan is um, just purely for operational reasons when it came to the digitization of the shares. So I'll give you an example. Um, here in Hong Kong, uh, we talk to the regulators and there's no, there's no legal issue with digitizing shares, but there are operational barriers. So as I said, number one is stamp duty. Stamp duty in Hong Kong must be physically stamped and legally title does not transfer until that happens. So it doesn't matter what blockchain based stuff you do, someone must track down every day to the stamp duty office and get something chopped. Uh, that's number one. Number two is Hong Kong has a public share registry, you know, companies registry. And again, I need to report transactions to them and until they accept it, it's not real. And it's not like they have API access to something that I can plug into. Someone still needs to go and type into a computer. And so, uh, you know, to us, we were always very keen that we really can make the leap to doing this pure digital. Where we say, the minute I send my digital shares from me to you, it automatically updates on the blockchain and that's it. That is the true and sole record. Uh, Labon isn't the only place you can do this. So, so any country that doesn't have these operational issues, uh, the Cayman Islands, the BVI, Bermuda, um, you know, all of these uh, are places where we know that we can natively, so to speak, create digital share certificates. Um, and quite frankly, that is exactly why on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, you know, 80% of companies are from Cayman, Bermuda, etc. Exact same reason, right? They say once you're public, once you have a lot of shareholders and a high volume of them, um, these jurisdictions offer a very convenient vehicle where you don't have these operational issues. Um, and that's also conversely why when I see a lot of tokens being created in other jurisdictions, like let's say the US, where I know for a fact that they still have to keep a offline copy. Like, okay, I, I, there are some benefits, but I feel like it's only halfway, right? Or well, I see a lot of people creating a digital token that they say is mapped to some offline asset or et cetera. And again, that, 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 that's fine, right? It works legally, but I think it just, it doesn't uh, as fully utilize the benefits of blockchain as it could. What does it mean then in turn for the access for retail investors to yes. your exchange where yes. Singapore and Japan, for example, right, have mm -hmm. come with their, their own regulation around mm -hmm. these things. Yes. Uh, Hong Kong since mm -hmm. last November yes. opt-in regime yes. for, for hybrid exchanges. Yes. Um, what's your ability to access investors yes. and pull them into your platform? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we, we have no issue with dealing directly with retail investors because, you know, a lot of these jurisdictions uh, are still trying to figure out how they want to deal with security tokens. But whenever we talk to regulators, they say, oh, what we really mean by security token is where you have a, a token and it is a security, but it's not a share, it's not a bond, it's not a fund, it's something a little different. You know, and, and, I, and I, to be fair, I think the reason why a lot of regulators are looking at it like this is that there were a lot of people who were trying to raise money through an ICO and their lawyers told them, oh, you can't do that, right? The way you're running this, it is like a security offering. And so they said, okay, we'll just call it a security on the, on the tin and that's it. But they didn't change anything about the underlying structure. And they, they, they still are sort of highly complex instruments in many ways, uh, which traditionally would look, would look a lot like derivatives. Right? They say, I have this security vehicle uh, and it has the right to another vehicle's assets and they'll hear all the terms and conditions and etc. And so quite rightly, again, regulators say, okay, what box does this fit into? Oh, it looks like a derivative. It looks like a securitization vehicle. Okay, uh, only accessible to professional investors because it's a complex instrument. Um, and what we've told uh, regulators and what they all seem very happy with is to say, look, if we move away from that, if we're doing just pure shares, real life company shares, 
um, you know, for example, um, in, in our jurisdiction, we, the issuer, have a requirement to keep a register of members. It doesn't specify how. It doesn't say you must write this down in a piece of paper or you, that you must have it in an Excel sheet. It just says, hey, you better make sure you know who your shareholders are. And so we say, look, we have technology to help us do that. But as long as we comply with all the same rules as though we were placing any paper share, right? We don't think there's any issue doing that. And that's exactly why we always encourage issuers to say, look, why don't you just jump to doing a full-fledged share offering, right? You know, Apple sells shares, right? You want to buy a share, you get ownership in Apple. It's very direct. It's very simple. Retail investors understand it. Regulators understand it. Why don't you just do that? So these digital shares, the digital tokens that Fuseng has, these are the same shares that I own as a founder, that the investors get. It's all the same. Where I think regulators quite rightly get worried is when they see complex structures and lots of different ones. When a lot of these entities, especially in the digital asset space, are selling equity to a bunch of VC funds and then selling this token to retail. And to be fair, right? Like, wait, 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 wait. How come you've got two different things? And how come the institutional investors want one thing and the retail investors, you're pitching something else? Hmm, that smells a bit funny, right? But I honestly think that a lot of these companies, if they just said, no, nope, we're digitizing our shares and we're selling it, I will obey all the usual rules. So for example, I'm either doing a private placement of credit to investors, or perhaps I do want retail investors to buy it, but I'm willing to file a retail prospectus like with any IPO. Again, every regulator we talk to says, okay, right? What are we going to say? You follow my rules? Fine. Sure, but if you're, if you're operating a license exchange and mm -hmm. you're operating a security yes. exchange in mm -hmm. Hong Kong, for yes. example, you need to be yes. licensed ultimately by the SFC. Yes. And so are you yes. getting an SFC license or? Yes. Well, no, so like I said, we, we're very clear that we only operate our stock exchange in Labuan, right? And, and, and more, more to the point, um, we have no intention of doing anything beyond that. So, you know, ultimately we, we act as a marketplace, right? We match buyers, we match sellers. Um, unlike a lot of exchanges, we do provide a lot of infrastructure, right? So we do, for example, help issuers do uh, AML KYC on the end investors. Uh, we do help process subscription money, right? We, we, we think we do need to provide that whole end-to-end -end value chain, so to speak. But we're still very clear that ultimately it's our job to run a clean and regulated marketplace. And that's it. And that's why we don't act as brokers, right? We don't sit on the side of issuers. We don't provide advice. Uh, we don't even help you place in your fundraise, right? It's our job to accept you as an issuer once you are ready to get listed. Uh, and we're very clear that, that you know, we need to avoid conflicts of interest um, in that front. Um, and that's why we tell issuers, look, I mean, you know, as far as we, we can tell, right, if you want to place, you know, you want to do an IPO, you want to raise new money, the primary offering from Hong Kong retail investors, there's actually no issue doing that, but you better go file a prospectus with the SFC, just like if you were to do any IPO and likewise in any other jurisdiction. Um, and I think that's also where, you know, the truth is, like, I think a lot of people get confused because um, a lot of exchanges in the digital asset space, especially in the crypto world, don't necessarily operate as traditional exchanges. You know, most of them operate much more akin to brokers, uh, many times because they are licensed as brokers, not, not, not exchanges. Um, but, you know, in many cases, they're taking prop risk or they are trading against their clients and all of these other things, right? Whereas we as an exchange say, we cannot trade in securities, period. That would be the most massive conflict of interest. We're supposed to be running the marketplace, right? And we are the ones matching buyers and sellers, but we are not the buyer or the seller. Okay. I think I understood that differentiation. Yes. Um, it brings us back a bit to like primary yes. and secondary yes. regulation, right? So. Yes. The, an exchange in, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong would fall in a primary regulation and how whatever banks, brokers, issuers then behave and what mm -hmm. standards yes. they need to adhere to. It's like yes. the secondary uh, regulation that also impacts on their behavior. Yes. And exactly. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just asking all yes. these questions. But so if I, if I was an, an issuer and saying like, I want to market my security to Hong Kong mm -hmm. investors yes. and the marketplace is in Labuan, yes. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you have had that conversation. Of course, I, and, and, and you know, it'd be no different than if you were to list on any other, list in Singapore or NASDAQ or et cetera, right? There's always two sides. There is where are you getting listed and you need to follow the rules and regulations, both of the exchange venue and obviously of that local regulator. 
And if you're offering securities into a jurisdiction, you also need to think about the rules in that jurisdiction. And really, in most common law jurisdictions, at least, it comes down ultimately to a private versus public uh, distinction, right? If you are offering to private investors, and again, in most jurisdictions, it's all the same criteria. It's around uh, net worth or income or something like that which quite frankly, I don't necessarily think makes you a sophisticated investor, quite frankly, but for better or for worse, those are the rules, right? If you're rich enough, um, okay, right? You get to access private placements, et cetera. If not, it's a retail investment, it's a retail placement. And it comes down to, if it's private, we need to follow private placement rules. If it's a retail offering, you need to file a prospectus and follow all the usual public and IPO placement rules. Um, but again, right, every jurisdiction we've talked to, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, all around the world, they all say, hey, if it's a share, we have rules. It's not like we just made this stuff up. We have very clear rules around how to do private placements, how to do public offerings. You just need to follow it. And I think the issue a lot of people have is that they're hoping that regulators will magically change the rules just because the technology is new. And as I said, I think that that's um, wishful thinking. Right? You need to say, how do I operate within the context of the rules as it is today? Yeah. And so it's interesting, it's like looking at some prior episodes, we, we clearly yes. had certain mm -hmm. companies that were yes. focused on the private markets, uh, some others that are looking at the public markets. Uh, you don't necessarily draw a boundary, you're saying you can do both. Uh, depending on what well, I mean, we, we can do both. But obviously, there is a distinction, right? So um, we as an exchange can support the listings of both public and private companies, but there are different roles thereof, right? So if you want to do a full fledged public market listing and IPO, uh, number one is we require uh, you have a licensed listing sponsor, um, no different than if you want to go to get listed on the HKEX. Um, and likewise, we would expect very similar disclosures, right? We would expect quarterly financials and all the rest that goes into being a public company. Now, obviously not a lot of companies are ready for that, right? Uh, for a lot of different reasons. And a lot of companies say, I want to remain a private company. I do want to allow people to trade in it. But then again, right? If you are placing securities, you need to follow private placement rules. And obviously you need to be restricted to trading among accredited investors. Do you see, because I think it was like the ASX, the, the Australia Stock Exchange, uh, they had a couple of companies that decided to delist and go private again, simply because the burden of all the public reporting became too costly. And so would you expect uh, more of that to happen? Or I mean, the flip side of that would be that companies stay in the private market, like we've seen, like the Ubers and the Airbnb and Welt uh, stayed mm -hmm. much longer private than any previous unique yeah. one before, mm -hmm. that companies for that reason choose to stay private longer and that will yeah. become a more important market? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess right now, I, I feel like the, the reason why companies decide to be private versus public is usually not just around disclosure. Um, it's around the fact that there are a lot of large startup unicorns that quite frankly can get a higher valuation if they remain private for a lot of different reasons, right? The way that private capital works and the amount of money sloshing around there, they don't actually want to be subject to market forces, right? And being traded and having fluctuating valuations. Um, because I think the truth is a lot of them would get substantively lower valuations if they were public today. Uh, and you already see that in a COVID world where some of the entities, these giant unicorn startups that are getting listed are actually looking at much lower valuations than their last private fundraising round. I think the, the like I said, the, the, the big dividing line between private and public before was always, uh, I talked to a few large institutional investors when I'm private, or at some point I just have tons and tons of shareholders that are nameless and faceless and out there. Um, and as I said, I, I actually don't think that that actually has to be the case. And part of the reason why I'm so excited about the idea of having digital shares is that I think you can begin to rethink what it means to be a shareholder. So, you know, the, the ICO days, especially in 2017, were quite frankly a massive hyperbubble. But I think that they were a really interesting proof of concept. You know, they, they, they showed that even if you had um, this token that quite frankly was worthless, it wasn't based on anything, 
if you really thought through how those value networks worked, you could actually juice a lot of value into these worthless tokens. And it showed that people were really interested in rethinking value networks. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Today, if I, you know, I'm an Apple fanboy. I own everything they make, everything, right? Top to bottom, every year a new iPhone comes out. I don't even think, I just buy it. And yet I don't own a single Apple share. Why? You know, to me, that's a very interesting question. And if I were Apple, that's the question I would be trying to answer as well, right? How come someone like Henry loves us so much, will tell everyone he meets that they should buy your products, and yet he doesn't own any shares? And, you know, the answer is because I don't get any special benefits for being an Apple shareholder. It's just a pure financial investment. It's not because I couldn't buy it, right? As you say, it's not that hard to get access, really, if I wanted to. It's just to me, it's a financial investment and I think there were better places for me to put my money. But if Apple gave me benefits for being a shareholder, non-financial benefits, honestly, whatever it is, I would buy shares tomorrow. You know? and, and today, the, the distinction between a company's customers and its shareholders is so separate. You know, companies have marketing teams to talk to their customers and then investor relations teams to talk to their shareholders. And it's two completely different groups of people. And then people complain, how come shareholders never look out for stakeholder interests? And I'm like, well, of course they don't. They're two different groups of people. And, you know, when, when in, in the startup world, we take it as a given that companies should give their employees equity because that's the best way of aligning interest. And I'm like, well, why not give equity to your customers too? If anything, they're more important. If your customers don't pay you money, you don't have a business, <laughs> right? It's game over. And why don't we rethink what it means to be a customer, right? I want to, especially in today's digital world, I think more and more businesses will become commoditized, right? And you need to think long and hard about, am I really providing a differentiated service? Am I really building a brand? Am I really building that sense of loyalty? You know, Apple has that, right, to be fair. Right? I, I don't just say, oh, I buy iPhones. I say, I am an Apple customer. I am an iPhone user. It's an identity. And of course, if I am an iPhone user, of course, I buy iPhones. That just makes sense. Right? They've done a very good job at engendering that. So much so that honestly, even if the iPhone that came out this year was not that great, people would still buy it. Because they're like, well, I buy iPhones, of course. Right? That, that's just how it is. And I think that a lot of companies, including companies like Fusang, need to think long and hard about how do we build that, that sense of loyalty, that sense of brand? And that's exactly why we have started to distribute our shares to our customers as well. Right? I say, I want them to feel at least in a small way, like they are part of this whole ecosystem, this value network, which I really think they are, right? At the end of the day, companies are just uh, stakeholder networks, right? If your employees don't show up for work tomorrow, you have no company. If your clients don't show up tomorrow and pay you money, you have no company, right? Companies are not these tangible constructs, right? They're just this, um, they're just an, an, an enterprise that everyone all kind of collectively decides to believe in. And so you have a company. And I think that if we can rethink how we, or we can start turning stakeholders of a company into shareholders, then that gets very exciting. And that to me is really what people in the digital asset space should be thinking about, right? What can I do with digital assets that I couldn't do before? Not just oh, it's a bit cheaper or quicker or easier to buy a share than it was before. That's a very thin benefit. It's how will this change completely the relationship between company and shareholder and what can we do that is uniquely different? Yeah, I hear a similar type of conversation often on the payment side, right? It's also mm -hmm. what you pay with. And yes. if you can incentivize the holding of Apple shares, mm -hmm. yes getting a discount on your next iPhone by actually yes. paying with Apple shares rather mm. than Hong Kong dollars, yes. then uh, that would be maybe a good incentive too. And you would need to mm. prove that you have held them for a yes. certain duration prior. Yes. Uh, but exactly. in the same way that you can do uh, real world transactions with Bitcoin mm. that gets converted on the fly into mm. the currency. Yes can do this, why not can do it with securities, right? Exactly. And, and, and Fusang has started to do exactly this, right? Uh, we said, you know, as a digital company, traditionally, we would go to a Facebook and we would run some ads and we would have a certain cost of acquiring every user. But I said, look, instead of me paying Facebook, why don't I just pay the user? 
right? Because genuinely, whenever the more users we have, the more value we as a company and as an exchange have. So why don't we just give back some of that value to users when they sign up? And, you know, again, this, it's just not possible with paper shares, right? To say, okay, I have a couple of shares. Um, with digital, that is very possible, right? Where we say, you know, you sign up for me, I give you my shares. Number one is I don't have to pay cash out of pocket to Facebook. But also I think even if you're a tiny little shareholder, there is a categorical difference where just psychologically you think a bit differently about the company, right? There's that, I'm hoping, there's that little sense of ownership and you just pay a little bit more attention to the company. Um, and obviously, if you're a client and you trade on our exchange and you generate revenue for us, it's good for us. And in a small little way, it's good for you too as a shareholder. And, and that's exactly how I think companies should think about these value networks, right? How do we make it so that the people who we rely on so that we have value as a company, how do we align interest with them and give back some of that value to them where it's win-win for everybody involved? Yeah, and I mean, the model as such is not new, right? I mean, even PayPal yes. gave you 10 bucks you know, 20 years ago when you signed up, but the exactly. 10 bucks are free exactly. and they don't tie you emotionally into the company or the platform. Exactly. And so you open up a whole new customer mm -hmm loyalty yeah. aspect there if you do yes. this real equity yes That's and great. you know i think it's really interesting that you mentioned customer loyalty because today that term you think of it as like you know uh, airline miles like it's this throwaway thing like okay as a company i should do have a customer loyalty program why not it's good but i'm like wait, wait, wait. when you really dig into that statement to me, this is the most fundamental thing. If you don't have customer loyalty, you don't have a business, <laughs> right? Then you're just competing, competing on price. And okay, sure, in any, in any category, maybe there's one company that can do that, right? Could be the cheapest and, and et cetera. But the reality is you need to build a brand. And you know, look at Cathay Pacific in today's world, right? I fly in Cathay Pacific, I get some airline miles. It's nice, you know, you get these points. Um, sure, why not? I'll take them. But, you know, why, why won't they think about issuing shares instead, right? To me, that's a much deeper sense of loyalty, where instead of now, especially during COVID, because I can't fly and I've got like a, a million Cathay Pacific miles or something, if I had shares, I'd be like, oh, I should fly with them, <laughs> right? Versus just picking the cheapest budget airline. And I think this is true of every business, right? If people are just competing on price, they'll just go to whoever's cheaper and you have a price war and nobody wins you need to rethink what it means to be a customer. How can we make it so that you will always want to fly with me and that you won't even bother looking elsewhere because the customer experience is so good, right? And I treat you so well. And because you have a very direct and aligned incentive, right? Where in a small way, you are a shareholder of my company as well. Right. Um, let me go back to mm -hmm. a bit where we started simply, uh, as again, bit into your approach to regulation as well but uh, one of the statements i liked from the prior conversation um that the, the i think you said the age of bearer instruments is over mm -hmm. uh, which seems yeah. been long over and so mm -hmm. there's there shouldn't be the fear of kyc aml yes. and the digital identity and as, as you explained yes. earlier right even if i wanted to get fusan shares it's not like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do a of Fusan yes. Ethereum transaction, I actually need to register to your platform, identify myself so you know yes. who owns your shares. And, exactly. Um, is that the digital identities of your own technology? Have you licensed something? And how you view this generally, because in, in many markets, a fun, fundamental problem mm. for anything yes. blockchain related is the lack of a digital identity. Absolutely. So, so it is, right? We've built our own platform that we very creatively call the Fusan Digital Identity Platform, uh, precisely because of what you mentioned, right? Um, a share is a token, right? Like if you have a paper share certificate, legally, that's just a token, right? Just because I hold it doesn't mean I own it. I have to register that share in my name. So it's the token plus identity equals to ownership in a company legally. And that's exactly why when we talk to regulators, they have no issue with what we're doing because it's the same thing as saying, instead of a paper token, I have a digital token, but you can't steal these digital tokens, right? Just because you have the token doesn't mean anything. It's token plus ID together represents ownership in a company. And, you know, I, I, I think sometimes our view is very controversial 
right? We, we, we for better or for worse, operate in a highly regulated environment where, uh, for example, we, 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 we need to have identity data on everybody we interact with. Um, and, you know, sometimes I see exchanges where they'll say things like, oh, well, first you do half KYC and then you can do some stuff. And then later you can do the rest. I'm like, I don't understand what that means, <laughs> right? Only by half KYC. Um, but look, to be fair, I guess right now, a lot of the crypto native assets, as I call them, like things like Bitcoin operate in a regulatory gray area. You know, it's like, oh, I'm not really sure what that is. You know, to my point earlier, regulators aren't quite sure what box to fit them in. So they kind of operate in between. But once it comes to a security, especially to things like company shares, there is zero ambiguity. The rules for how you need to deal with these things are crystal clear. And so, look, I mean, I, I guess there are other people out there trying to take different approaches, but that's not our approach, right? We think that there is so much benefit to being able to just provide a digital interface, right? And that most people actually don't mind at all following those rules. Most people don't mind at all giving the identity information and going through KYC has been our experience. And I guess conversely, if people are not interested in that, we are quite frankly not interested in, in dealing with them. It's also that from a jurisdictional perspective and not, never traded with law, yes. but I know it as mm -hmm. an insurance yes. capital center among many yes. other things. Um, but you are, have, do you have capital gains taxes at all? Is no. So it's a total tax no. neutral yes. location. It depends yes. on your the tax jurisdiction you live in, and you exactly. also need to handle anything, any obligation from that perspective. Exactly. Yes. Yep. So very Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I think it was in June, end of June, you announced a partnership with Securitize. Yes. So Absolutely. Securitize with Carlos, who spent yes. a lot of time in Japan as well. Um, yes. Anything further coming along mm -hmm. those lines? Yes. What's the rationale? What's your expectation for that partnership? Look, like I said, there's, there's a lot of security tokens that have been issued out there, and there's just not a lot of activity with them, right? Not, not, not even sort of the, the more uh, well-known security tokens that have been issued, but you know, a lot of uh, uh, traditional companies have issued things on, let's say, the Ethereum blockchain, a lot of um, Um, even, for example, um, I'm talking tomorrow with a, with a gentleman from Morningstar who did a rating on a bond that Fatburger issued, but it got issued and then nothing happened, right? I mean, they, they really don't end up getting traded anywhere, which kind of, to me, defeats the whole point. Uh, and so um, one of our top priorities in the next few months is just providing a home such that these security tokens can get listed and traded on our exchange. Um, number one, uh, but also beyond that, obviously, we think that to take us from here, right, in our pre IPO round to when we're ready to do our full fledged IPO, we need to be able to demonstrate that we can just take real world assets that people would buy, whether or not they're a digital format, just because they think it's an interesting asset, and show that we can actually take them through this end to end process and get them IPO'd. Um, as I said, the truth is, I think a lot of assets there are. People buy digital tokens because they're digital and it's cool, right? And, and we need to say, no, nope, here is a very boring instrument, um, you know, prove that we can do it just with our technology. And, and so, for example, some of the things we're working on in the coming months that um, I think are quite exciting, um, you know, we're, we're in the process of listing a bond from a global bank. Uh, the bond itself is bog standard boring. Um, it's about as risk-free as gets. It's fully guaranteed by the parent bank's balance sheet. And so predictably has almost no return, right? Especially in today's low interest rate environment. Um, and these are the kind of things that this bank will list on traditional stock exchanges all the time, right? Nothing terribly exciting. But we think if we can show that we can digitize that as a fully blockchain-based asset, that again, people can buy and access in a unique way, that alone is very interesting. And that's exactly the kind of proof points we're focused on. Right, just taking these very traditional assets and showing that you can give people access in a unique way. Yeah, and it's I mean the the big bank example is interesting because you can do this more efficiently and at a lower fee because like the fixed income fees are still outrageous mm -hmm. for bond issuance. Yes. Um, but then also yeah. at the 
say the social good side, there are so many SMEs who would benefit mm -hmm. from better access to funding yes. if it was more direct and less costly to do. Um, this whole SME lending market mm -hmm. that is so cumbersome for these yeah. small companies to exactly. actually get access to, you can just give them public market access with yes. digital processes. Exactly. And like I said, you know, uh, to me, the difference between traditional and digital assets is, you know, in some ways, it's very thin distinction in the same way as like, you know, traditional commerce, e-commerce. It's like, yeah, it's like kind of the same thing. You have a website. But I'm like, I, I think that small shift alone will have bigger impacts than people realize. You know, I completely agree with what you say when you say that, hey, I can log into Robinhood and buy Apple stock. It's not that hard. It's an app. It's easy enough. But that's just the, the first layer. Right. There's still a lot of layers of intermediation that will go into that. There is still the, you know, the broker networks, the exchange member networks, the custodial networks, how the settlement happens, all the way down to ultimately if Apple, sh Apple issues new shares, there's going to be a company agent sitting in Delaware somewhere that will deal with that piece as well. And we think that digital assets will disintermediate a lot of that. I actually don't think it will decentralize things. You know, that, that's the buzzword in the blockchain industry, right? Decentralized everything, no centralized parties. I actually don't think that'll happen at all. Like it or not, again, especially when it comes to securities, regulators need a centralized party to talk to and to regulate. But I think that we can disintermediate a lot of the process where we can allow companies to issue and raise funds directly from the end consumer and vice versa, right? The end consumers can go and trade directly with the company. And, you know, I was on the Disney website a while ago where yeah, uh, struggling a little more now during COVID, but at least like six months ago, they were riding high. Um, and, you know, we were thinking about how best to present Fusang in our mission and our strategy. And I was on Disney's corporate website, because I think they do it beautifully. If you ever go um, and, and they talk about their vision and, and really what Disney stands for. And then halfway down the page, they've got the Disney stock ticker and their share price. And in big bold words, it says, you cannot buy Disney stock from us directly. Please go talk to your local broker or RIA. I say, you know, that's so interesting, right? When it comes to any other product, what company in the world today would not grab that opportunity to market direct to the end consumer, right? And Disney has a better distribution network than any bank on the planet, right? They've got more touch points, a better brand, better everything. And yet, when Disney wants to sell stock, you know, again, layers and layers of intermediaries. But what if Disney could sell stock directly to you? What if when you were at, I don't know, the Disney parks, they would rethink what it means to be a shareholder? even for big companies like that, I think it would dramatically flip what it means, right? And, and I think that just as with e-commerce and social media, it will happen with smaller companies first, companies that cannot access that current world of intermediary and distribution networks, just like with e-commerce and social media, will say, okay, I'm small, I'm niche, I'll take this as a chance to go direct to consumer. But in the coming years, I think that this will just be how all shares are placed. And we're going to look back on today in five, 10 years time and say, oh yeah, I can't believe that in 2020, everyone was doing everything on Zoom and yet we still had paper-based shares. Very true. But I, I think also again, from, from a social perspective and social context, uh, if you look at the finance industry and this particular insurance again as well, many of these companies have been, uh, have a mutual history and right? they've been, policyholder owned companies and then it's at some point in the 20th yep. century somebody had the smart idea to become rich in an instant and do an IPO with them. What you described mm -hmm. just now and that's I find this very fascinating so spend a lot of time on it but it's, it's almost would lead you back to a remutualization of mm -hmm. certain industries or even more broadly than that. I think it should be, right? I, I think that, look, even Warren Buffett says, you should buy companies that you know, that are within what he calls your circle of competence. And, you know, I, I see so many retail investors today go to their local broker, get the latest prospectus shoved in front of them, and, and they buy whatever random company it is without knowing anything about this company. And I, I find that a bit sad, actually, because no matter who you are, there are plenty of companies that you touch and interact with every day. Our lives are run by companies. And I think that's part of the reason why the tech stocks are doing so well today, in large part because we really do touch them every day. And we say, you know what? I have confidence in Apple. I don't need to read a prospectus. I don't need to look at any data. 
they sell good products and I want to own their shares. And that's about as far as most people get. But I think it should be like that at a much deeper level and much more localized, right? Every single day, right, we touch and feel brands where you wouldn't need a prospectus to know if the company's doing well or not. Even down to, you know, you go to your local restaurant, you can tell the minute that food or service quality declines, right? Because you know it, you touch and feel the product and instantly you're like, mm, not going well, they'll be out of business in six months, right? <laughs> and so those are the companies I think people should invest into, right? Companies within their own circle of competence. And I think that not, a, not, not just in terms of making it a good investment, but I think that, you know, when I look around the world today, I, th I feel like a lot of people have this sense of, of disconnect and disenfranchisement where not just in terms of companies, but you know, our communities, our countries, people have the sense of, I don't feel like I'm part of the community and vice versa. I don't feel like the community is looking out for me. And I think this is no different than what happens uh, at a lot of large traditional companies, right? Where you're like, I just show up, I do my work. I don't really feel engaged. I don't, don't really know what's going on, whatever. I just cash my paycheck. And then of course, um, in, I guess you can call it more modern companies, we say, of course, you better make sure that employees have shares because what better way to make sure they're aligned and actually feel like they are part of something. And like I said, I think it should be exactly the same way for customers. Where Hopefully in a few years time, we'll say, well, of course, you should be a shareholder of the brands you use and you should be engaged in terms of how they run as opposed to just this very us versus them scenario, right? Just like in companies, that's how it used to be. It was management versus the staff. And I feel like with a lot of companies today, it's the company versus the customer. You know, I'll give you a very real example of Uber in its early days. I started using Uber when they were still had an early beta version of the app. There was no uh, uh, geotagging. So you would call an Uber, it would say five minutes away, but you had no idea where it was. There was no map, but you could press a button and it will call the call center directly with just one tap. And you'd say, uh, hey, where's my Uber? And they go, oh, I'll check. And they're like, oh, it's right around the corner. I promise it's coming soon. And go, okay, cool. And quite frankly, it was a terrible product. They didn't have a lot of cars. It was slow, it was expensive and all the rest of it. But I and a lot of people used them because we felt like in some way we were part of disrupting the taxi industry, right? And we were helping to usher in the future and all of that jazz. And somewhere along the way, I feel like they lost that. You know, today I cannot talk to anybody from Uber customer service. It's gone, right? You have to just text. And, you know, if something goes wrong, it's, oh, it's obviously your fault as a client, <laughs> right? It's the first response. It must be you doing something wrong. And again, I just, I don't think companies can survive long like that. Sooner or later, if, comp if your customers don't love you, they'll go somewhere else, right? It's so easy to go somewhere else in today's world. And I think the same is true in the finance industry. Right? How many financial institutions, how many banks can honestly say, hand on heart, my customers love us. And you know, if they don't, if they interact with you because they have no choice, I think that's very dangerous. You know, I, um, I mean, one fun example to give is um, Southwest Airlines. So not a lot of people in, in Asia have heard of them because they were a US only budget airline. Um, but, but during uh, the 08 the crisis, they were in big trouble on the verge of bankruptcy. And a lot of people, mailed in checks to Southwest Airlines just to give them money, just to say, you know what? You've looked after me all these years. I know you're in trouble. I just want to give something back to you. Just free and clear. How many companies have customers like that? How many banks, if you were in financial trouble, your customers would say, you know what? Take some money out of my account for yourself. You know, you, you deserve it. You've looked after me all these years and I want to make sure that you continue in business. Right. And, and I guess me as a business owner, I'm like, never mind the money. It just feels great. Like the idea of being able to have customers like that who you serve and who you deliver enough value to that, that just, just love what you do. And I think that there's no better way of doing that than if we can start to think about how can we convert all of our stakeholders into shareholders? We're all in the same boat and can all think about how do we deliver value as part of this whole ecosystem. I love the vision. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, positive in and uh, really a positive shareholder capitalism and we i think we all sorely need this so um fascinating conversation and fascinating story I, again i think the the origin story with the family offices and so on and the transformation into the 21st century 
uh, um, gives you a strong backing also on the investor side, right? Once the exchange is, is up and running, clearly mm -hmm. you have access to investors to bring to the platform as well. It's yeah. a strong position, strong vision, um, just just quote unquote needs execution. So we wish you- Absolutely. And that's that. what I tell my team, <laughs> you know, as, as I was it? I can't remember, it was Einstein or Edison who said a vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that's everything. And that's hopefully what we'll prove in these coming months that we can actually execute on some of these things, starting, as I said, with ourselves, right? That's why we said, hey, we'll, we'll raise our hands and we'll go first. We need to be willing to eat our own cooking. Yes, absolutely. Super. Um, again, thank you very much for the conversation. Thanks for taking yeah, thank the Thank you very much. Story. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll check back in uh, in a year's time. So uh, around the IPO then. Absolutely. Thank you. Super, thank you, Andrew. Take care.